information foraging theory is one of the most important scientific concepts for you to understand as a user experience designer or as a user experience researcher. And if you understand foraging theory a little bit better, you're going to see how people use your products totally differently and much, much more accurately. So the good news is that foraging theory is actually pretty easy to explain. So imagine you're a cave person and you're out foraging for berries or food or whatever, and you come across these three bushes or three patches. Which patch, which bush are you gonna kind of forage and go look at first? So right away we have this concept of patches. Patches in information foraging theory are kind of like defined groups of potential information. And we'll get to some examples in a little bit. But for now, you're the caveman again, you're deciding which patch to interact with, which one is it gonna be? It's probably not gonna be the one in the back, right? That, that bush all the way in the back, that patch in the back looks pretty thorny, right? It requires a little bit too much effort to get to those berries. That's called interaction cost. That bush in the back has too high of an interaction cost. And because of that, you're not gonna forage it. The idea of interaction cost comes from kind of how we evolved. We evolved to wanna to forage things that are gonna give us more calories than we have to spend getting the calories. So if I forage that bush in the back, I'm gonna scrape my hand a couple times, my body has to use calories to heal those wounds, right? I'm gonna to have to walk, walk further back and reach my hands in there. That's all costing me a lot of calories probably more than I'm going to get from the five berries it looks like that are on that bush. And information works the same way. So a product that's really, really hard to use and doesn't give you much value, you're just not going to use it. So that's interaction cost. And now we have two bushes left. We've eliminated one. Which of these bushes, they have about the same interaction cost, right? Which one would you choose? Well, probably the one on the right, not the one on the left, right? The one on the right smells like and looks like it has more berries, more potential value for us. And that smell of value, that's called information scent. It's how valuable a product or a design or a little piece of a design smells to us based on our current goal, which is kind of changeable, and we'll get to that in a second. So we have two factors so far. One is the interaction cost, the big hurdle. How much effort does this thing take to use? And the other one is information sent. How valuable does this product or service or whatever smell to us? People engage with products and engage with designs that smell and feel worth the effort. If you're paying attention, you might have picked up that there are two ways that you can make something worth the effort. You can make it really, really low effort, like low interaction cost, and then it just takes a little tiny bit of information sent, a little smell or whiff of value to make you interact with it. And you know this because if you've ever been browsing TikTok or something, and you come across a video that's kind of interesting, but it's only 15 seconds. So if a video is only 15 seconds long and it's kind of interesting to you, why not, right? That's very low interaction cost and weak information sent. The second way you can make something worth the effort is you can keep the interaction cost high, but make it really, really strong information sent. So this is that experience you've had when you're like browsing the internet and you come across an article or a video or a course and it's like speaking to your soul. You're like, I must read this article. It contains the most interesting possible thing to me, but it's paywalled. And what do you do? You do anything it takes to get around that paywall. Like you'll go back through Google and try to get to the article that way. You'll find other websites that are hosting that article or that video to try to get to it. Or like what I've done is I've like viewed the HTML of the website and deleted the paywall pop up so I could read the article. I've done that. Or maybe you even like pay for a subscription to like whatever newspaper it is to actually, like actually be able to read that article. Like that's how they got you, right? That's the, that kind of experience is when the information sent is so strong for you that it's overcoming that high interaction cost. But the best case for making a very engaging design is when we have very, very low interaction cost and super strong sense of value, super strong information sent. So the people are just feeling like, oh, this smells so valuable to me and it's so easy, I'm gonna engage with it. That's the dream. And that's what you should aim for whenever you're designing things. Super high value, super low interaction cost. So let's apply this to YouTube. Let's say I go to YouTube and I search on how to understand people and I get these results. Right away, what are the patches? You can think of these broader interface elements as their own patch, like these tags at the top might be one patch, this might be another patch right here, this whole set of shorts results is a patch of information. You could even say that this navigation over here is a patch of information that you could potentially forage. But within sort of our results set, the patches are pretty much like the video squares, right? Patch, 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 patch. Each little search result is a patch of information. Those are the patches. 
What about the interaction cost? What are the interaction cost signals on these YouTube videos? Well, probably like the length. You know that this TED Talk is like 18 minutes long. It's probably going to be a bit of a time investment for you. But these shorts, these shorts are a perfect example of the power of low interaction cost. You know by definition that they're short. They're less than a minute long. Super, super low interaction cost, which means it only needs a little bit of information sent to get you to click one of these. So the interaction cost of a YouTube video is probably the length of the YouTube video. But sometimes it can be subtler things like how easy the title is to understand or something like that, or how easy the thumbnail is to process. Those sort, those still factor into the interaction cost. Now let's do information sent. So the cool thing about information sent is that it changes based on your goal. Information sent is how much something smells like it matches the goal you have in your head. So let's change your goal. So let's say you're looking for a video on how to understand people on this page um, that's coming from a sort of an authoritative source, coming from an expert. Now what do you look at? You look at maybe like this guy's like collar, he's got like a shirt, they're dressed formally, you got the Google logo right here, dude's got glasses, all these like subtle sort of signals of expertise like TED the logo, you know, Google the logo, those, those feel very sort of authoritative, right? Now watch this. Change your goal in the information sent changes. So now say instead of looking for like something authoritative like an expert, you want sort of a good story, some good like sort of life wisdom about how to understand people. Now suddenly you're looking at David Goggins over here. This guy's a uh, former Navy SEAL, right? Really kind of compelling, interesting person. Now you're like, okay, uh, definitely David Goggins. That's probably gonna give me some good like life advice, life wisdom, life experience advice on understanding people. Suddenly this David Goggins video right here has a really, really strong information sent for you. And like these Google Talks have basically no information sent. There's like just some boring expert. I don't want that. I want some good like life wisdom, right? So information sent changes based on your goal, and your goal can change really, really, really fast. So as people are foraging things, that information sent is constantly changing. Let's change it one more time. So now look at this YouTube page and pretend that you want to find an entertaining video on how to understand people. Now suddenly, like the information sent for these TED Talks and David Goggins goes way down, and the information sent for these TikTok videos right here goes way up. If you want to be entertained on this topic, then these TikTok videos have a much higher likelihood of giving you that value, and these sort of stuffy experts and the life advice has a much lower information sent for you. So that's information sent. It changes based on your goal. Okay, last concept is called patch switching. So so if you have patches of information like individual YouTube videos or individual search results or products if you're designing an e-commerce website and you were to measure how much time people spent looking at each patch or foraging each patch and try to figure out when they move to a different patch, that reveals a lot about how they feel about each patch of information in your design. People forage patches that feel worth the effort and they leave patches for another patch when that patch they're foraging stops returning value. So you can learn a lot about your designs and about your information patches by looking at how people browse them. If you think of a museum, museum is a perfect case for information foraging. Each painting in a museum could be considered sort of an information patch. And museums do a really, really good job of keeping you circulating, right? They want to keep you moving through the museum, spending a little bit of time foraging each patch and moving on. They don't want you to get stuck too long. Another example of patch switching is Netflix. Imagine you work for Netflix and you're trying to measure how many videos in a given set of videos are interesting to a particular user. And if you were tracking that user's eye movements, what we'd probably see is different patch switching patterns. So each of these Netflix movies could be considered a patch. And if a user is really bored and a particular category of movies is not interesting to them, you might see a patch switching pattern like this, where they're like bored, 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 trombo, nah, 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 you know. And that's what you kind of do when you're not interested in a Netflix row. You kind of check in with one movie maybe and then you kind of keep moving on, right? But what happens when you're really, really interested in one of the Netflix categories? Like let's say you're thinking, uh, you know, I kind of want to like get away and just sort of escape for a little bit, maybe maybe some reality TV or something like that. And the Netflix shows you one of those hyper specific categories like escapist reality TV. You're like, oh, that's perfect. That's exactly what I want. What do your eye movements do? They do something like this, right? You're like, oh, the big flower fight, Rust Valley restores, restaurants on the edge. Every 
every single one looks good to you. Which one am I going to choose? That foraging pattern looks really like you're stopping at each one and foraging each single one. So your patch switching isn't rapid. It's very like even. You're pausing at each patch, right? Unlike this pattern at the top where you're pretty much just switch, switch, stay, forage, switch, switch. Your, patch, your switching patches very quickly. So anytime you see people kind of switching patches more slowly and deliberately, they might be finding each patch kind of rewarding, where when you see this pattern at the top, this sort of boredom bump, you're kind of seeing people who don't find very much engaging. It's a very unoptimized row here, whereas this bottom one's kind of optimized. And you can think of this when you're on Instagram or whatever, when you're really engaged in everything in Instagram, you're paying attention to every post, right? When you're just not feeling any of them, you're just scroll, 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 right? Scrolling and scrolling and scrolling is switching patches really rapidly. But scroll, pause, scroll, pause, scroll, pause. That's switch patch, forage, switch patch, forage. That's kind of a good indicator of an engaging design. That's it. That's information foraging theory. You just want to forage things that give you more value than you have to spend in calories to get that value. Things that are worth the effort. Interaction cost, information sent, and patch switching. It applies to every app you've ever used, every website you've ever browsed. You are foraging for information. You are information foraging right now. And when you watch users use your products, just notice when they engage and when they switch and what that says about the interaction costs and the information sent of each of those patches that you're designing. Hope that's helpful. Follow me on YouTube. I'll post more stuff like this, sometimes for scientists, sometimes for designers. I'm on Twitter or whatever it's called now at Mike Morrison, LinkedIn, Mike A. Morrison, and I have a substack called UX Scientist. And now it's time for you to switch patches.